Welcome, and thank you for coming to the first of a six-part series brought to you by the Kentucky Arts Council, Emergencies, Disasters, and the Arts. I'm Chris Cathers, the Executive Director of the Kentucky Arts Council, and on behalf of the Arts Council staff and board, I want to tell you how pleased we are today for each and every one of you to be spending time with us, learning together about these important issues. Prior to today's presentation, I want to offer a land acknowledgement. <clears throat> Today we stand on ground occupied by ancient peoples whose history has been lost, but whose legacy remains. The evidence of these people can be seen all over Kentucky through the mounds and artifacts left behind. Today, over 170 American Indian tribes are represented by their members living and working in the Commonwealth. Let us honor those who are here and those who are here now and build on the legacy of stewardship of the land they left for us into the seventh generation. Now I want to turn it over to the Arts Council's Executive Staff Advisor, Emily Moses, to get started with today's presentation. Thank you, Chris. I'm Emily Moses, Executive Staff Advisor for the Kentucky Arts Council. I am thrilled you are with us today. There is a great need in our communities across the country to address the multitude of issues around emergencies and disasters that affect the arts field. We at the Arts Council became involved in this work following the historic and catastrophic long track tornadoes that left in their path expansive devastation in Western Kentucky on the night of December 10th, 2021. Seven months later, on July 27th and in the following days, historic and mass flooding in the Appalachian Mountains of Eastern Kentucky caused devastation and destruction in the region, again, with significant repercussions for the arts community. In both instances, organizations were completely destroyed or experienced significant damage to physical structures, archives, collections, artwork, all gone in an instant. The lives and livelihoods of hundreds of artists were affected by lost property, homes, studios, lost equipment, supplies, finished work, works in progress. And notwithstanding, in both instances, communities that stood proud one day were gone the next. Many friends, neighbors, and families lost everything. And between the two disasters, more than 120 people lost their lives. As you can imagine, and as some of you know from your own experiences, there's an extensive need for resources to navigate the aftermath of these disasters for the arts field. Today, we're going to introduce you to two of those resources, the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response, also known as ANCAPER, and Performing Arts Readiness. We'll soon be joined by Jan Newcomb and Tom Clarison to talk about these organizations that are essential for you to be in contact with following a disaster. And there are also reasons to be in contact with them now, as you'll find as Jan and Tom explore ideas of preparedness and readiness in their presentation. But first, we've invited a special guest, Nance Gunn, to share with us about the experience her organization had following the tornadoes of December 2021, when the beloved Ice House Gallery, home to the Mayfield Graves County Art Guild, was destroyed during the disaster. Welcome Nance and thanks for being here with us today. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for inviting me. Um, first of all, I just wanna thank the Kentucky Arts Council for all the help that they've given the Mayfield Graves County Art Guild in trying to figure out how to come back from the devastating tornado. Um, Emily and Chris, you've just been awesome in your friendship towards our art guild and for um, all of the grant funding that um, was made available. So um, again, my name is Nance Gunn. I'm the uh, director of the Mayfield Graves County Art Guild. And in um, 1995, um, the Kentucky Heritage Council set us up at the Ice House. And so I just wanna give you a little bit of um, background about our art guild before um, the December tornado in 2021. We had a, a wonderful art guild. Um, our nickname was always the Ice House Gallery. And I, back in 20, 
10, we actually um, are very proud recipients of the Governor's Award for the Arts. You can see the gallery that we had set up. Every month we had a different gallery show going on. And this is the room where the historic ice house was functioning back in 1930 when it was originally built. If you look at the, um, the gray beams on either side, those are the beams that the gurney would go down to um, drop the vats of four foot by four foot water into um, ice to make the ice. And the ice house was actually selling ice out of it all the way into the 1980s. And so it was quite a historical and beloved building for uh, the people in Mayfield. They have a lot of very personal memories of it. So this is our impression show. This is our longest running show that we've had with the Mayfield Graves County Art Guild. Um, if you go to the next slide, Emily, this is the, the next room over, and this is where um, the ice was stored and distributed, and it became our workshop area. And so in, in this case, we're looking at Jan Jones, our assistant director, and uh, we had a, a stained glass art class set up, and it would run all week where um, Mike Driver would bring in all of his supplies and we were just um, super active with all kinds of, of workshops. Uh, the year before the tornado, we had 50 different um, classes going on in this room. So it was um, very active. If you could show us the next slide, Emily. So this is the north view of the ice house. And if you look at the Ice House Gallery um, poster, that was made by Mel Garbark and one of our board members painted that on the side of the Ice House. It was very beloved. And if you go to the next slide. It took 45 seconds for that tornado to change that same view to this. So um, the night of the tornado, uh, the whole wall disappeared and crushed all of the beautiful artworks um, that were everywhere throughout the ice house. Uh, the next day we went in and uh, dug all of our computers out of the rubble. Uh, we tried to um, save what we could. Um, we ended up being able to get all of the hard drive material off. We sent them out to an IT company to do that. But when the tornado hit, it opened up all of my files. And so I lost everything that was in paper. It was just gone to the wind. When I started doing insurance claims, um, fortunately, we had really good insurance. And so because um, our, our icehousearts.org, our website was all um, on another server in another location, we were able to reconstruct a lot of what was lost in the ice house for insurance for, uh, purposes. We had pictures, we had uh, the artist names, the value. It was a very extensive website with pages and pages. And so because of that, I was able to um, get an insurance uh, payment for 109 artists who lost their art or had it severely damaged from the tornado. If you go to the next slide, please. This is a, um, a Helen LaFrance painting. And the, um, the roof of the ice house was just lost to the tornado, but the ceiling fell and um, it did a tremendous amount of damage to what was not whipped away in the winds. And so um, this Helen LaFrance painting was punctured by the ceiling in several places. And um, 
Paul Aho is standing there on the left. He is the director of the Paducah School of Art and Design. Uh, he was able to take this painting from my husband, who's on the right, and uh, just do a beautiful restoration of this painting. And um, he still has it uh, in Safe Harbor at the Paducah School of Art and Design on beautiful display. Uh, so, you know, the files were one thing to save, but the other thing was just saving the art and trying to get everything out we could to either reunite it with the artist or do an insurance claim or resurrect it, do something to, um, to save these valuable pieces. If you go to the next slide, please. We were very fortunate um, several months later that um, this statue was still intact. It was made by residents of Mayfield and uh, put on the front porch of the Ice House back in 1995. And so one of the artists um, who was originally involved with this statue, it's huge, it's life size. Uh, it's just laying on its side wrapped in blankets. Uh, they were able to come. We had six men come. We had a, um, a forklift from Schmidt Concrete. They came and we were able to rescue this statue to bring it to the library. And so I think that was kind of the final piece that we were able to save from the Ice House Gallery before it was bulldozed. And um, it was bulldozed because um, no one could figure out how to rebuild it. When we first acquired the Ice House back in 1995, it just took $75,000, $25,000 to buy it, $50,000 to renovate it. But now today, it would have cost over half a million dollars to um, save that building. And so because no one, the tourism committee, our art guild were not able to do that, it was, it, it's gone. And so as an art guild today, um, we were fortunate over the last year that we had 26 different facilities open up their buildings to us so that we've been able to uh, hold workshops, summer kids art camps, art shows, so even without a home, uh, we've been able to carry on as an art guild. And uh, at this point, we are still homeless. We are still trying to figure our way out of our predicament to have lost this gallery. So um, I, I hope none of you ever have to go through what we've been through, but um, it, it sure took a lot of people's help to get us as far as we've come. And we're very appreciative of, of all the help that we've received. Thank you, Nance. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing with us today your experiences. They're so important as we explore these topics. If you have any questions today for any of our presenters, please pop those in the chat and we will address them in the Q&A portion at the end of our presentations. Following disasters or when an emergency situation occurs, there is a need for extensive support for the arts community, financial, informational, personal, organizational, local, state, and federal government support. Emergency situations and disaster response are special circumstances that can be navigated with help from people with unique skills and knowledge in the field. Part of this series aims to introduce you to those people and organizations. So it's our pleasure to present today Jan Newcomb with NCAPER and Tom Clarison with Performing Arts Readiness. Welcome, Jan and Tom. We are glad to be working with such a large group from across the state. And I've seen people from some neighboring states who are on today's session as well. Well, do you so, want to start, Tom? Or? Sure. Yeah, just to give a little bit of background on the two of us. Um, I'm Tom Clarison, and I'm the project director for Performing Arts Readiness uh, at Lyricist. And um, I am actually uh, based in the Columbus, Ohio area. So uh, very close to Kentucky, very close to hearing the news about uh, the disasters that have happened. Um, I have been involved in library, archive, and museum 
preservation and disaster response for about 30 years. And then uh, really about the past six to eight years um, have turned my attention to a lot of work with the arts. And Jan? Thank you, Tom. And I'm Jan Newcomb, Executive Director of the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response. We affectionately call NCAPER for obvious reasons. Um, but I also work with Tom on the Performing Arts uh, uh, Readiness Project. And I'm the one that over decades of, of uh, working, I was a mu musical dancer, I guess is the way to say it. And um, but I've run 10 arts council, 10 arts organizations throughout my career. And I learned about dealing with disasters and crises as on the job training. So I come with, with some practical reasons why uh, learn from my uh, action, you know, what I'm telling you now, do as I say, not as I have done, because uh, we, we talk to a lot of um, up and coming uh, students who are in degree programs for uh, becoming arts leaders. And, and we try to encourage them to really get this in their, their uh, toolkit so that they don't have to learn the way I learned how to deal with, with disasters. So thanks so much for inviting us, Emily. And we're gonna be here to convince people that they need to be uh, getting their plans in order and to be ready for the next disaster because disaster is the norm. Definitely. And uh, yeah, I wanted to set up uh, something here. Emily had said, Tom, could you give some working definitions related to disasters? And these are definitions that I've come up with during about the past 30 to 35 years. Um, and I wanted to give these to you now because we're going to be talking about emergencies, disasters, risks, all sorts of things um, during the afternoon here. Um, so I would say from my experience, an emergency is something that can damage between one and 500 items. Um, it can be props, it can be scores, it can be books, it can be you know 500 items that in uh, Nance's case, um, letters that might have blown out of file folders or something to that effect. And in a lot of cases, when it is an emergency, it is something that you may need to uh, deal with with your organization's staff, your organization's volunteers uh, before you can uh, get any outside help. With a disaster, it's a little bit bigger. It can be 500 items or above. And um, that is something where you'll oftentimes have to call in potentially disaster vendors. You might have to call in emergency management of different types um, to assist you. So that's sort of uh, the dividing line uh, that I would suggest there. Then we get to the idea of a community-wide disaster. And what we see there is, where would your arts center be? Where would a local museum be if there was also damage to a local hospital or the city hall or a school? And if you do some preparedness, if you do some outreach in advance, in some cases you can work with emergency management vendors with organizations and say, hey, let me tell you about my organization before the disaster happens. And then they'll be able to take action as quickly as they can when they can get around to working with your organization. So think about what would happen if there was a disaster across your whole human uh, community. Risks, hazards, vulnerabilities. I put these down here because sometimes when I'm talking and teaching, I throw these terms around a whole big bunch. Um, and so these are really interchangeable terms for the things that cause disasters. Um, it's because of the risks of the area where your building might be built, um, how the building is built, what hazards there are around the area from uh, flooding to other things and vulnerabilities that, uh, in the building as well. And then mitigation. This is gonna come up a number of different times as we talk. These are things that you can do before, during, and certainly after a disaster to make things, uh, the result and impact 
less severe and less damaging and certainly less damaging the next time around. So on our next slide, we wanna talk a little bit about why we uh, are looking at these topics. Um, and uh, it's uh, the idea of um, the fact that so many disasters, both natural and human-made, happened in 2022 and uh, in 23. And so we have uh, the, the National Weather Service and there you know, was saying $15 billion of damage from disasters. Uh, a number of hurricanes, flooding, particularly in Kentucky, Missouri, tornadoes in many areas all over the country, and water crises, wildfires, uh, drought. We really have a lot of these natural disasters that we are having to deal with. And unfortunately, we are also having to deal with uh, situations where there have been shootings, where um, they have, in some cases, um, certainly affected families and communities, but also affected uh, organizations and arts organizations. So really, we think about, as devastating as the pandemic was for everybody, there have been a wide variety of other types of disasters in this past several years that continue to occur that have damaged and continue to damage arts organizations. All disasters start locally. Some might cover larger geographic areas, uh, but flooding, whether from a hurricane or a leaky pipe, often has the same disastrous effect on an arts organization. So what we wanna do is really talk with you about how you can make a coordinated and effective response to these different types of emergencies and disasters and create resilience within your organization, the ability to respond and to bounce back that can make the difference between survival of the organization or bankruptcy of the organization. So on our next slide, um, unfortunately, one of the things, uh, we've been looking at this quite a bit and Jan found some really interesting and unfortunate information um, and uh, the idea of why the US leads the world in weather disasters. And you can see that third little paragraph there, we have two oceans we're dealing with, the Gulf of Mexico, mountain ranges, uh, peninsulas like Florida, storm fronts that are clashing into each other, and the jet stream can really cause a lot of difficult weather here. Um, and the other thing is because of where, what, when and how we have built things, um, we sometimes face even worse cases after some of these disasters happen. So you're not imagining it. It's actually the US leads the world currently in weather disasters. And unfortunately, we have seen in the South that uh, there are uh, have been a growing number of disasters in the South and Midwest, particularly in the past couple of years. So with that kind of uh, framework, I want to hand things over to Jan to talk a little bit about how we can look at uh, the arts community helping to respond in disasters and how we can rebuild after disasters happen. Thanks, Tom. This is uh, from uh, these two points are, uh, were written by Amelia Brown. And uh, she gave this, uh, this was part of her speech that she gave to the International City and County Management Association in uh, October of 2020. Amelia, worked in New Orleans following Katrina and then founded Emergency Arts. She worked in the city of Minneapolis Cultural Affair off Affairs Office and believed that no matter the crisis, whether it was a hurricane, a pandemic, a police killing, that art was the key to responding with force and compassion, knitting together communities and lifting voices not often heard. And I just want to reiterate where in emergency management, we want the arts sector to be at the table, table, not on the menu. And in preference would be for us is we set the table. So uh, let's be thinking, uh, and according to Brown, artists can really be helpful. She said, Serving in New Orleans helped me de 
develop a deeper understanding that emergencies can lead to opportunities. She wrote this in an essay for, uh, for uh, the US Department of Arts and Culture. And she said, one of the most precious opportunities is to rebuild community with people gathered around an emergency who were once strangers and became family. And I know that Nance, you probably feel that in, in your community and what you've been through as you in Kentucky and other places that have had disasters, you build, you have all of a sudden so many more new friends and, and parts uh, uh, of the community that you really didn't know you had. So artists in reading these, what, what, do we can, what can artists bring to the table? Um, I think one of the most important thing is that the arts can overcome social barriers such as language and culture. And one of the things in that um, uh, article that Tom was quoting about the US being the, the kind of the mother load of disasters, when tornadoes hit, um, there are so many immigrants that come from countries in Central and South America or, or Africa who do not know about tornadoes. They don't know what to do. So they're uninformed. And they were, uh, it, they were badly uh, you know, unprepared. And, and if we could get to them through arts and culture and start, start really helping people be better prepared, then it, it will mean you know, fewer lives are lost and hopefully um, uh, people uh, resist, are more resilient. And this goes with a uh, poverty level too. It seems that people, when you have, you're lucky to have insurance, which is great, but it was so nice about Nance's experience that he was able to help the individual artists who lost their work because they probably wouldn't have had that insurance would be my guess. Um, arts and cultural organizations can help in very practical ways. Uh, this happened in the theater district in um, after Hurricane Sandy, very much so. Uh, providing shelter to displaced um, um, people, uh, providing communication support. I mean, cell phone, uh, being able to get charged on your cell phone was great because all the, um, the uh, more Northern, uh, Manhattan groups had electricity. And then also the reunification for sites for family and meeting spots. And they also would provide uh, arts education opportunities to those children of those filling out FEMA forms and trying to get help for the family that they provided this kind of um, uh, just getting everybody thinking about different things and, and doing some art. And we found that um, there's a hospital music therapy outreach program in Houston after Harvey. And they, they realized that how effective their musical therapy program was. They now have a bus or a, a, you know, a truck or whatever it is that goes out into communities that, that don't have access to this. They found that after experiencing um, the effects of Harvey and how they were able to help people not only heal, but to, to, to have something else to think about. So being leaders in community-led mitigation projects is another way that um, or arts and cultural organizations can help. Back to um, Amelia again. She uh, had an essay, Six Principles for Arts and Emergency Management as Part of Art Became the Oxygen, an Artistic Response Guide. She used definitions included in the 100 Resilient Cities Framework, if you remember from Rockefeller uh, Foundation. Emergencies can be number one, chronic stresses. Those that impact us daily, and in cycles such as chronic unemployment, violence, water deficiencies, or they can be acute shocks with sudden distressing events such as terrorist attacks, earthquakes, or floods, or as in uh, we were talking about tornadoes. And hazards can interact with one another and they can overlap as natural, technical, and human caused. 
So as Tom was saying, this is where we are and we probably at this point, it's gonna get worse. We're gonna have more often, we're going to have um, more disasters and, and, and we just have to begin to, to understand how we can behave and plan so that we can mitigate some of the horribleness of it. So I'm gonna turn it back to Tom who can okay. give you some more information. Yeah. And, you know, I think we'll start talking about resources pretty soon. I know that this is actually uh, probably pretty bracing for, for your, everybody to, to think about and to hear about all the situations, the disaster situations that have been happening. But there are a number of resources out there. So we'll talk about those in just a few minutes. But we wanted to set a little bit more of a context, um, particularly for arts organizations and artists, uh, about what can happen in the time of a disaster. Um, you know, certainly, and we'll sort of start counterclockwise from the left here, there can be loss uh, or injury as far as life and health issues. Disasters can have fatalities, but also they can make an emotional impact that makes it difficult to, uh, for people to create artistic work or to perform. Um, we can see that there is damage or loss of facilities. This can be certainly your performance facility, uh, which uh, would be a, a large scale problem. But what about if you have a different rehearsal area? What about your office spaces or your storage spaces where you might have props and other materials stored away? And what if that gets uh, disturbed or uh, destroyed? Loss, damage and destruction to other property. Uh, and this can be everything from sets, costumes, scores, instruments, texts, rehearsal notes, but also, as Nance was saying, it can be office equipment and it can be files of important information. Um, in some cases, we hear the tools that are used to create work like paint, paintbrushes, canvas, and computers um, all can be damaged as well. So these are some of the things that we have to look out for and hopefully we can have insurance for um, or we can figure out ways to protect them or recover them if they do get damaged. And finally, the one that we all probably think of first is loss of income. What happens for canceled performances? What happens because an audience might not be able to make it to performances that do take place because they've had damage in some other area um, near their homes? Um, canceled fundraisers and events and canceled classes. Those are all things that we have to look out for. When we look at our next slide, this is where we can bring in emergency management, both emergency management thinking on our part and emergency management uh, resources out in the field. Um, really, uh, we wanted to take a bigger picture look at emergency management and think about FEMA, statewide emergency management, city or county emergency management, facilities managers, and even your plan. And I wanted to just talk because we can't prevent some of these things from happening, but what can we do to be more ready for them? And what we can do is think about this emergency preparedness cycle. And that includes the idea of preparedness what you do before a disaster happens. Put together a plan of how you would recover if something did happen to your organization. Response, this is what happens during the immediate period after disaster in the first 24 to 72 hours. And this is getting your props, getting your artwork, other materials out of a facility that has been damaged, out of floodwaters, recovery. This can be initial recovery, but then we also need to think about what type of long-term recovery do we need to look for? I worked many years ago with a library in Arkansas, and they had a situation where um, their, uh, the roof of their building was hit by lightning. It caught on fire, and then that roof collapsed into the building, and water from a rainstorm came in they were able to get a lot of their materials out and a lot of their materials dried, but it took them two years to get back into their original building. So they had to think about long-term recovery. And then the other thing that we've mentioned and will keep on popping up throughout our discussion, mitigation. 
preparedness for the next time. So thinking about that is important. Now, we need to think about these steps on our next slide about gaps in the emergency management system that has happened uh, to arts organizations. So you'll see a sort of uh, adapted version of that emergency management cycle um, in the, uh, the top of the slide here. So there's planning and preparedness, response, support and recovery, and then the evaluation of the system again, mitigating things to make them uh, easier to deal with the next time. And we have a lot of wonderful resources that we can work with in the disaster management sector. I want to take this alphabet soup that we have here and do a little bit of translation. We have local and county offices of emergency management. We work with state agencies of uh, emergency management. There's the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA. And there are VOADs and COADs, and those are volunteer organizations active in disasters and community organizations active in disasters, which are often faith-based groups or community-based groups who can work with you if a disaster happens. And of course, we work very closely and very carefully with hospitals and even public health organizations. But where we saw gaps and where the whole reason for being for NCAPER and PAR came through is that there wasn't a lot of information tailored to arts organizations. There weren't resources for lost income from disasters. There certainly wasn't a lot of good conservation and preparedness advice for the arts community. Um, there wasn't money for repair of tools and repair of facilities. Um, and there weren't a lot of good resources for artists. And nearly a quarter million artists lost employment due to the pandemic. And performing arts companies reported 54% decline in revenue during 2020. So we have arts organizations that are still struggling with the ongoing impacts from the pandemic, including lost income, uneven economic recovery, and expiring government supports. So we wanted to see what could we do to help do a little bit of filling of these gaps. And on the next slide, you'll see the sort of cog and wheel system here that is a number of organizations that can work together. Um, development of emergency management uh, for the arts and cultural heritage sector during the response to Katrina showed some weaknesses in how the cultural community was set up to deal with disasters. So this led to a little bit of uh, resurgence of emergency management thinking and national arts funders really stepped in to support artists and arts organizations. And one of those funders was the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation that supported a number of organizations that are on this list here. Arts Ready, um, which provides planning tools and resources. The advocacy and networking and after the, after the disaster calls that NCAPER has put together. Training resources and funding through PAR. And then uh, Surf Plus, the Craft Emergency Relief Fund, uh, now the Artist Safety Net, um, works with individual artists and individual crafts organizations. So these groups all are starting to work together. And we also work with the Heritage Emergency National Task Force, which is a sort of nationwide umbrella of arts and color, uh, culture organizations working together after disasters. So what we're gonna do during the next few minutes here is that Jan and I are gonna talk a little bit more about our specific organizations and how they can help you. So I want to provide a little bit of a brief background on uh, the Performing Arts Readiness Project. So on our next slide, um, you'll see uh, uh, the list of our steering committee members. This whole uh, activity with PAR started with a meeting in 2015 that the Mellon Foundation uh, brought together, and then a planning grant in 2016, where we talked to organizations and people in the arts field and said, would this type of training, would this type of information be helpful to you? And then finally, uh, we brought together a unique blend of arts and preservation and conservation leaders for our steering committee. So you'll see lyricists, 
the Conservation Centers in Philadelphia, Midwest Art Conservation Center in Minneapolis, ICA, uh, which is um, the Inter Museum Conservation Association in Cleveland, and NEDCC, the Northeast Document Conservation Center. These groups have been working with libraries, archives, and museums for years to recover from disasters. So these groups were standing at the ready and we started to work with well known to you, um, a number of great uh, resource organizations like South Arts and Arts Ready with um, groups like the Kentucky Arts Council and the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, which has been a leader in this type of recovery as well. Um, NCAPER is a key player here as is the Western Arts Alliance for organizations on the West Coast, and then the International Association of Blacks and Dance and National Performance Network are two other groups that have been working a lot with disaster preparedness and recovery and working a lot with their memberships and even networking out into the field even more. So in the next slide, looking at PAR resources, we have a wide variety of services um, that reach both producing, creating, and presenting organizations. And one of the biggest things that we discovered in 2016 when we were talking people to people in our focus groups were that organizations without facilities needed this kind of help as much as organizations that had their own bricks and mortar buildings. We were talking with companies that traveled between five and six places presenting their performing arts um, uh, programs. And they said, yeah, at one of the places, one of the locations, we might know where the fire poles are, but we go into the other five and we've never been given a tour. We don't know who to call if a disaster does happen. So we look for working with both of these types of organizations. So we have outreach and community engagement presentations like today. Informational resources, this is really important. We have a very active website where there's information going up all the time, a mailing list of almost 4,000 organizations and artists, and an extremely active uh, social media media program. When we started out, we used to have maybe one post a week. Now we have just about a post every day. Our circuit rider project is a local way to set up emergency response resources. Um, we actually pay for a 50% person uh, in, uh, have paid for a 50% person in uh, 10 areas of the country to help local arts councils or um, states uh, provide training, consulting, um, surveying in an area templates and tools, the arts ready tool that we'll talk about a little bit more. And the we have something called the loss of income calculator. I call it the board scaring tool because this loss of income calculator looks at how much money an organization could lose in ticket uh, prices and uh, lower attendance. And it really convinces people that they need to put together a disaster plan. Um, training and conference programming, more on that in a minute. And new, we have disaster network and disaster planning grants and money. And um, what we can do here is we have new grant applications that are going to be out next week. So you're the first people to hear about this. We finally are getting these things ready to come out in, as part of our new grant. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. I also wanted to let you know very quickly, we have a special focus that has been going on since 2020 on festival safety. We have a festival safety program called the Art of Mass Gathering, which is an interactive program where we have classes at a festival and we now have festival safety audits that we are doing. And um, we are looking at doing one in Kentucky at the end of May and hope to do even more in the future. Uh, we do a lot of arts administration program presentations to grad students and have done those with uh, University of Kentucky and others. And we're working even more with emergency management programs than we ha ever have before. So real quickly on our next slide, I just wanted to show you a little bit of the list of the, uh, we have 20 free webinars that we offer. And these are both live online with internationally recognized instructors that can uh, actually answer questions in the classes that they're doing live on the spot, 
or we have recorded versions of all of these that are available for 24 seven, 365 uh, type of use. So you can get to the recordings. Uh, we have in our next slide, uh, institutional disaster plans. Um, and uh, we will be offering 24 grants of up to $7,250 to performing arts organizations to create emergency plans. So you can bring in consultants, you can bring in trainers. Um, $1,250 or more can be used for equipment and supplies like a panic button, like one place where they said, oh, it's a three-story building and we have one uh, fire extinguisher. We need more fire extinguishers. Um, and then travel and staff time can be uh, compensated for here. So there are a bunch of disaster plans funded by PAR that are online at our website under sample emergency plans. I think there's 10 or 12 there, and all of these have been created with PAR grants. So look for this information to come up early next week about this new round of funding that we have. And on the next slide, the other thing is PAR networking grants. Um, seven grants of between $5,000 and $25,000 are going to be able to be applied for also starting next week. And so if there have been uh, you know, uh, disaster, uh, existing disaster networks in the state. It could be to increase the participation participation of arts organizations within those existing networks or to develop new networks. And so we've developed some networks in Northeast Ohio that have, um, continued for years. We have stepped in with some of the Pennsylvania uh, emergency response groups and had them start to think about bringing arts organizations in. Um, in New Orleans, they have a network that is uh, getting very close to 50-50 and in Houston as well with arts and culture organizations. Um, so look for these uh, types of grants as well. The last thing I'll talk about is um, our uh, tool that we have here. Um, it's the D-Plan Arts Ready tool. These were two existing tools that had been around for 12 to 15 years. And um, this actually brings them together. And it's one interface for you to be able to get for tools that can work with cultural organizations and arts organizations as well. And it helps you build components of your disaster plan. And here's the thing, for arts organizations, this is really important. Right now, under our grant from the Mellon Foundation, we're able to waive the first year subscription fee. The subscription's under $60, but even the idea of being able to waive it for a year can help arts organizations get into utilizing this and then have a place for their plan to be stored both on their computer, but also off-site um, in case they need to get to the disaster plan later. So Jan is able to give more information on this, and we can do that both later in our discussion and uh, as a follow-up, but I actually want to turn things over to her now. Thanks, Tom. As I said, I'm with the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response which was formed in 2006, really in response to uh, Katrina and Rita. And whenever all those gaps that Tom mentioned really were revealed. And uh, NCAPER is the only national discipline agnostic arts readiness response and recovery organization within the arts sector. And we've developed a response system that serves as a safety net to complement the services of general relief providers as a stopgap measure for those not serving served by federal disaster programs. And there are the majority of the art sector is not served by FEMA, SBA, et cetera. So NCAPER advocates for preparedness and disaster support for the entire art sector through publications and resource development. And we also facilitate uh, post-disaster and virtual convenings for affected artists and arts organizations to connect them to funders, service organizations, and businesses who can help with their needs. We did that twice, both in uh, Western Kentucky and Eastern Kentucky. And these are our 
our organizational members that, that get on those calls and listen and try to respond to questions and to give information. So you see music here. So if you were a performer, a musical performer, or even a, a person working uh, with a performer, um, uh, I always say groupie and that's the wrong word. So uh, um, uh, as a roadie, um, they would be yes. potentially be able to have uh, help. And, and uh, we also train arts responders to work with their communities on readiness and mitigation projects. So uh, we have uh, good participation and we also get sometimes extra um, members kind of uh, come and go, more funders come uh, on these calls. I mentioned resources. These are resources that we have right now and have developed just in the past since 2015. The Cultural Placekeeping Guide is to help communities create emergency response networks like, like Tom was talking about. And uh, so you can uh, actually rely on each other and have this, this uh, network going so when something happens, somebody has a fire and needs a venue, you kind of already know who can do what and help. And that's, you know, any kind of preparation like that saves you time, which saves money. Um, we also, during the pandemic on the left here, you see the arts organizations at, at a crossroads toolkit. We found that so many organizations went out of business and or were thinking, it, uh, thinking about going out of business. So, Molly Quinlan Hayes um, prepared, did a lot of research and, and interviews and got some, how, how do you manage these transitions? How do you preserve your assets? And um, she put all that together. One of the most important things there, I think, is, is uh, how do you keep your best asset is your, your people, your staff and what they know knowledge wise. And how do you keep that from going away when somebody no longer is with the organization? So there are techniques that you can have that you can do on, on a very order in a very orderly way to cross train staff, and so that you don't have these these huge gaps when somebody leaves or gets ill or whatever. So that's been important. And you'll see the field guide here, both in Spanish and in English, and I think we sent about a hundred of them to Kentucky when uh, after the disasters, you can, these are free downloadable. Of course, I sent the printed ones so uh, that people could have them in their hands and not worry about running off 50 pages of something. Um, but these are available on our website. And uh, the idea is giving, when you're, when you're in the stress, of the moment of responding to disaster. You need to know, you need an easy guide. Where do I go? What are the telephone numbers? And, and not only is it FEMA, but SBA, which uh, you, you could possibly know that you can get loans, uh, but you have to apply and you have to apply to FEMA first. And it's all very complicated. And as you can think of, it's very governmentese. Um, sorry to those present who are work, government workers, but uh, we tried to make it uh, so that you could easily understand what to do and where to go. And there are 11 uh, departments, federal departments, like agriculture and things like that, that have resources in, in available to people after disasters. So, you know, something to look at. Uh, so. We, we uh, at NCAPER, we don't have money like Tom does to give out for grants, but uh, we do have uh, readiness response and, and recovery uh, uh, activities. And what happened is we realized that we, these facilitated phone calls following, um, uh, well, initially when I came on, Harvey and Irma and Rhea, they they were they really had uh, an impact. However, we realized that that we needed training for people on the ground, 
who, who could work with communities in a, in a more organized way. And so we, re, we uh, decided that the crisis anas analysis mitigation or CAM coaching network training um, was something that would be helpful to do uh, for arts responders. So anybody working in arts administration would be able to apply to this program and become a trained uh, CAM coach. And what that does, you learn a little bit about FEMA. You have to take a basic 101 FEMA 101 certification course. And um, it, 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 you learn how to facilitate community uh, involvement. And in, by 2024, a nationwide network of up to 32 arts responders will be trained and certified. And our partner is Air Collaborative. And they uh, have a, just a wonderful way of uh, teaching people how to become coaches, how to hear everyone's voice, how to, how to bring people together. And so, this is a, uh, uh, we had, we started with the Mellon money and then we got Tremaine Foundation to, to kick in for 2023 and 2024 to train up to 12 people. And you see, we, there, we are missing some states here. We need to, we, we, my goal would be to have every territory and every state have a CAM uh, coach in it. And the Creative Crisis and Mitigation Coaches Cohort began in 2021. And um, they learn how to implement workshops and programs in their com communities to help connect the arts and creative sector to emergency management work. And the objectives here, this is straight out of the air uh, philosophy, is to create local networks that include both the emergency management and creative sectors. Oftentimes these people have never met before. They certainly um, don't necessarily work with each other until a disaster strikes. And then it's, it's always better if you know somebody um, before that happens. So building and strengthening grassroots community awareness and um, understanding of the management cycles and systems and then to do, develop and expand community-led preparedness and mitigation projects that using arts and creativity. And I'll just quickly go over these steps. You can read them at Air Collaborative is a field tested and iterative three-step pathway to design to build innovation and economic stability, um, sustainability. So engaging, gathering, and then shifting. The idea is that you have an outcome that maybe can shift people's understanding uh, of, of something. And in this case, shifting how a community responds to the next disaster. So keeping de disasters uh, from occurring. One FEMA mitigation staff joke is mitigation. We make nothing happen. That's their, their motto. And um, the idea that, that we use the blue sky time and that's after you've kind of come up for air and, and your things are calmer and you start to sneak back into your old ways. We try to get communities to talk about how they could involve infrastructure investments and focus on better serving all the people in all the communities who don't get help. So these were two, uh, a couple of um, three-day workshops in Washington, D.C. and one in Houma, Louisiana. And just what came out of a three-day discussion amongst groups where food scarcity was a, a Baltimore uh, neighborhood issue. And so the, they're going to develop a community garden in, uh, in under-resourced neighbor, under neighborhood, serving a primary school and assisted living facility. And then the, uh, another project they were going to do is community street fair raffles. They're going to bring people together 
This is a community where there's a lot of distrust and try to uh, get people more under, uh, more educated and knowledgeable about what is available to them. In Homa, it was, I mean, I, it's a very small place and there were three pastors, the police chief and all these people involved in these, in these discussions. And they talked about communication is really, really difficult. And we know that Alabama or Louisiana gets a lot of um, a tornado activity and uh, hurricanes. So they uh, are going to have a community radio managed through an IC center during crisis times and do data collection performed by churches and community centers. So they're gonna have a point of, of contact and give out radios that you crank out. But I love the other one is communication and distribution during natural disaster. People don't often, you know, you don't have power. You don't have, and people don't, a lot of 25% of the population there didn't even have Wi-Fi. So they're going to have an artist design a 15 foot cat five resistant tree sculpture that will have uh, solar and wind power. And it's gonna have speakers and Wi-Fi and backup power generated generator to be a gathering and dis a distribution site. These are the people in the community saying we're coming together and we're going to do these projects and it will make the next time easier for us to communicate. So if you get nothing else out of all that we've said, <laughs> these are the organizations. Just know in the back of your head, there are people who um, and organizations who are here to help you. And um, we want to be involved in your planning and uh, getting um, your community involved and making sure that you can not have as much devastation as what, what Nance was talking about. I mean, it's, it's horrible, as you know. So these are, the uh, partners in preparedness. And thank you for listening. And I guess, Emily, you're going to lead um, questions. Yes. So I will stop sharing. Yes. First of all, thank you all so much for the information that you have shared today. It is amazing. I see that someone asked in the chat um, if the recording will be available because there are so many wonderful resources included. So just so everyone knows, the recording will be um, available almost immediately on the Kentucky Arts Council's Facebook page following um, the event. And then we'll also put it on our YouTube channel and I will send it to everyone who registered uh, for today's presentation. So yes, definitely made available. If you have questions uh, for our presenters today, please go ahead and pop those in the chat. Uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, and to, while we wait on those, I um, always have a million questions for Jan and Tom and um, Nance. There were a couple of things I wanted to ask you. Let me start with you, Nance. Um, one of the greatest fears, I think, in uh, emergencies and disasters that affect the arts is the real loss of arts and culture in a community or a region. And I know the Ice House Gallery is very important um, in Mayfield, but also in the greater Western Kentucky region, representing hundreds of artists over the years from the region itself. Um, because your building was uh, blown away, um, I know that you had those early fears of losing the organization itself and you still don't have a physical home. So how have you navigated keeping, um, keeping your programming going and keeping uh, motivation for continuing the services of the Mayfield Graves County Art Guild um, while you're still working through many of these issues? Well, that's been one of the high points for me after the tornado is just to have so many people reach out to us. Because of all these people that have reached out, we could still do art shows. And by doing art shows, we have artists having goals to make new art and have something wonderful to display to the public. 
Um, we've had all kinds of facilities reach out to us for doing workshops. And so um, through um, email and Facebook and all these um, things online, we've been able to reach out to people to let them know that we have art camps and um, adult classes so that they can, you know, enroll in them and where it is. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember whether we're going to the library or the Graves County Cooperative Extension, but I mean, we, we've got things going and um, if, if people really like arts, they just figure out how to contact us and, and participate. What role have you seen um, the arts play in the community as far as recovery and in response? What, what ways have the arts helped people in the community? Well, art is just so personal. Um, it, we had this amazing art show just here at the bank. We're, we're in Regions Bank right now. And um, I'm just standing there with a stranger and looking at art and she just started crying. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's very, very personal. And um, it, it uh, is amazing. Um, this little show that we had in Mayfield, it's actually the first show that we've done since the tornado in Mayfield, everything else has been in Paducah or other cities. Um, we had busloads of kids coming through. Uh, we had probably eight different busloads of people coming just to view the show. And it, it was it was wonderful. We never had that many busloads come to the Ice House to view a show. So yeah, um, there have just been uh, wonderful ways to reach out to people that we didn't necessarily have before. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Nance. Um, Tom and Jan, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, um, so if I'm a person, I represent, I'm an artist or I'm an art stakeholder or I represent an arts organization and I want to become involved in this work or I want to better prepare for the, the many ways that there are entry points into this kind of work, where do you recommend that I start? Where would a person start if they wanted to become involved in, in this work? Well, I would say um, start with the uh, plan arts ready, you know, start making sure you understand the process uh, of creating a disaster plan, a readiness plan. And I think that just even the 90 questions that are that we walk you through will give you um, you know, like, wow, I never thought of that as being something we need to think about because we, you, you deal with uh, all the uh, functions of an organization. And that's even true if you're an individual artist and, you know, are a business in, in, in that respect. But I think it's contact us, you know, if you want to be involved, if you want to be part of NCAPER, if you want to be um, just, uh, and also the PAR website, uh, the on the PAR website are those webinars too that I think are really helpful and may give you some ideas. But yeah, just contact us and making sure. I mean, we can always use um, resources and creative people. I mean, even not creative. We can yeah, and I would say in addition to that, uh, Emily, one of the things that we have seen is um, with more and more of these disasters happening, the idea of sort of like minds thinking together in arts organizations and in libraries, archives, and museums, and people starting to network with each other. And, you know, one of the things that has been really helpful is, say, if one organization is very badly hit, um, there may be ways to do some mutual aid where people can, uh, who work at other organizations that might not have had such bad damage, can get get time that their uh, organization will give them to go over and help that uh, other one that has been damaged. Um, so this idea of 
uh, building your network, getting to know um, organizations in your area has been really important. And I know that, um, you know, uh, with Nance's organization, um, with organizations in uh, the uh, the Paducah area, um, there was a lot of really good networking that's continuing on in Western Kentucky. And um, so, and we try to, Jan and I try to always follow up on that and always give as much support as we can and point people toward community foundations, point people toward other organizations um, that can give them um, some support. Yeah, that networking, I mean, we want a state and local activation team in every state, you know, and not just a CAM person, but so you, uh, it's very difficult when something happens in, in it's like, hey, who's in Houston? You know, who do I call? Because we initiate um, these uh, fac uh, and facilitate these phone calls. And, you know, you want it to have everyone there. So working with you, Emily and Chris, to get people in Kentucky who were able to come to these uh, phone calls and, and just you know, we'd listen to what happened. I mean, it's an important, it's an important process, part of the process. And the more quickly we can make that sort of thing happen, I think it gives people hope. It gives people, it gives people like we had calls weekly, then biweekly in um, Puerto Rico and uh, the Virgin Islands for over a year. That's how long they they really needed our help, and part of it was to listen you know, not only solve problems, but listen. It's important. And I saw Roger May's name at Apple Shop uh, pop up on here. And one yes. of the things that I have been thinking is Apple Shop was struck very uh, severely by these disasters that happened from the flooding. But at the same time, as the region was trying to rebound, as the region was trying to recover, Apple Shop became a place where they were hosting national uh, organizations um, to come in and do teaching, national organizations to come in and look at um, assessing the damage in the area. And so that has been, um, you know, a, a, a way that organizations, even ones that have undergone some of these uh, situations, um, have uh, stepped up and helped to network in their area as well. Yes, we saw that a lot in both Eastern and Western Kentucky, where there were organizations, like you mentioned during your presentation, that uh, some of them that had been affected, like Apple Shop, and others that were their fellow, uh, you know, uh, organizations in the region who responded in many ways, like shutting down their services to become community centers mm -hmm. and things like that. So we've seen here in Kentucky lots of different ways um, the arts have helped in Western Kentucky, I know with Nance that there were many organizations in Paducah that, um, you know, came to their aid, including an organization like you talked about, Tom, that allowed some of its staff to help with some bookkeeping tasks. So uh, I know there are lots of things like that that go on, which I think um, leads me to this next thing. There is a gap uh, around organizations like that in uh, among the organizations that are affected and um, fellow organizations, there's a gap in services that exist, and I wonder if you could address it, where um, there aren't a lot of supports, especially financial supports, for folks to recoup any of their um, expenses or their losses in the way that they uh, are responding and contributing to their own communities following a disaster. So you both mentioned, you know, gaps, and I know those have been addressed over the years, but what still exists? What's still out there that needs to be exists as far as gaps in services and funding? That was a really long question, and <laughs> I understand if you might have gotten lost in there, but gaps basically is what, what I'm asking about. Mm -hmm. Well, FEMA, um, until a presidential declared emergency is declared by the president, um, nothing starts as far as uh, uh, availability of funding to a community or, and then for individuals, there has to be public, uh, you know, for individual assistance, 
has to be part of that declaration. And so you can be a plumber or an artist and, uh, you know, at the, until you get that, that kind of declaration happens, you, you're not, you can't apply for, um, uh, you won't get any, any help. But we always encourage people keep applying and to FEMA because if you don't, and, and even if you get turned down the first time, we, we tell, tell them to keep going and reapply. And that's in that field guide. There's a lot of uh, information that people can uh, get uh, that will possibly help them. Like I mentioned, Department of uh, Homeland Security and agriculture and things like that. Um, but it, disasters are local and so are the solutions. I, I, I don't know how else to say that, but uh, and Kentucky, unfortunately, is the top state in disasters. You know, everybody thinks it's one of those trick questions because I think Clay County, I used to know the top three um, and your uh, Oklahoma, there's there's three that are almost as, as uh, disaster prone. Everybody always thinks, oh, it's Florida or something. No. Kentucky is is the uh, most disaster prone state. So getting those people together, the resources and getting this network like you're doing um, uh, with the Arts Council, I think it's so important because if you guys are united, it's going to help the community at large. Yeah, and I think, um... I hope I don't, I've been having a little bit of uh, audio trouble on my side. So um, let me know if you have any, any gaps in what I'm saying, but I think, you know, the Kentucky Arts Council for uh, a year and a half now has stepped to the forefront um, in being able to find funding and being able to find resources. And I think that that is uh, extremely important. I would say, you know, we've worked with places like Hartford, Connecticut, and a number of other cities where the local arts agencies have been um, really stepping in. Um, and uh, Jan mentioned a couple of different times Houston and what happened after Hurricane Harvey. One of the things that happened after Hurricane Harvey was the Houston Arts Alliance became the first place in the country to actually establish a um, person on their staff to be a full-time emergency management contact. Um, so, you know, is that something that could be looked at um, in, in many places? The other thing is that um, for all of our work, whether it's for the work I do for libraries, archives, and museums, or the work uh, that I do for arts organizations, I love to uh, make connections and be a matchmaker with funders. And so I'm always talking about the importance of working with community foundations. And I think that there have been some community foundations that have been quite active and quite helpful um, in Kentucky after these disasters. And um, you know, knowing those groups, knowing that a local bank has a foundation um, can be really important for people to be able to, uh, to get some funding as well. And we work, uh, Grant Makers in the Arts is one of our um, steering committee members. And I think one, and they're, they're really understanding now that funders have to step up. They just have to step up and, and do this. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so they're very helpful. They reach out to their community, you know, when something happens in Alabama, for instance, um, they will send out to all their orgs or members in, in that state or nearby and regionally. And then they introduce us, you know, as, as resources. And, and that's kind of getting, developing those stronger connections. But that's how we have to do it. I mean, and, and you might get most help somebody who's gone through something like a mudslide in California. I mean, you know, we try to get people to help like that uh, Houston Arts Alliance person, Lauren Hanley is a CAM coach. And she can, and she talks, she's part of her emergency response team in, in Houston. And now the Houston endowment is supporting all that and supporting her, her position because they came to some, um, 
something that Tom and I did as a little dog and pony show at Grantmakers in the Arts conference. And he said it put seed in his head that, okay, we can be part of this. And he said when everything happened after Harvey and they were raising all this money, he said it just kicked in and became a natural for Houston Endowment to step up. So that's how it happens. And, and um, you have to, job's never done. And um, you, you know, it's like if you've been a teacher, you can't say it once and have everybody know it, especially if you're one of my teachers. But um, anyway, so, you know, it, it's, it, we're here to help. And that's, I think, the most important thing is we can help you connect. And we want to. Thank you so much. That's a that's a great place to end for the day. You mentioned Lauren Hanley a couple of times, so I want to tell everybody that she will actually be presenting for us in June, I believe. She's one of our presenters great. and she is amazing. So we hope you'll join yes. us then too. Mm -hmm. Big thanks today to Jan, Tom, and Nance. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your all of your many experiences with us. We know we have a lot to learn from you and we appreciate your time so much. Thank you to everyone who came today and for sticking with us. Um, we hope to see you again on May 23rd for our discussion with Ruby Lopez Harper and Cameron Baxter Lewis with Surf Plus, which is truly the artist safety net supporting craft artists for more than 30 years by providing support during difficult times. Thanks again to everyone and have a great afternoon.